Welcome to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. <laughs> Dell challenges the status quo, questions everything, and empowers you to return to your core beliefs to make your life better. If you're ready to hear the truth and get your roadmap to the lifestyle you really want, the next hour will change your life. And now your host, self-made millionaire, national award-winning investor of the year, CEO and founder of Lifestyles Unlimited, Del Wamsley. Welcome to Del Wamsley Radio Show, where the hype ends and the help begins. I'm your host, Del Wamsley, and as always, we're working on your financial freedom. But to get there, we may have to work on your intellectual structure. What do I mean by that? Well, throughout the years... I have found that there are people that are successful and people who aren't. And most of the time, when you get to meet the successful people, they all think pretty much the same way. I mean, with with given, you know, personality differences and where they grew up and, you know, some social differences of different kinds of, you know, whether you grew up in New York or California or the South or whatever, those are a little bit different. But... But in reality, successful people have some pretty good, pretty common core belief systems about life. And uh, I've been reading self-help books ever since I was a kid. And I wonder if that's exactly what the difference is. Do successful people read self-help books? I don't know. You know, I don't know if that's the common core or not. I wouldn't guess differently I would assume that may be the secret, right? But it's interesting because uh, I've read so many different self-help books that there are so many different points of view, but they keep getting what I call distilled back down again. In other words, if you read books written 200 years ago, the ideas seemed unique at that time, but then you reread a book that's only 100 years old, and there they are again maybe spoke a little bit different order or different way, but the reality is they're still there. And if you read stuff that's written 50 years ago, you can find the same stuff is there. So when you look at the results you get in your life, those results are pretty much going to be dictated by, in my mind, your point of view. And today what I've done is I've brought up a a self-help book here by a guy named Tony Robbins. You probably all heard of him. He wrote a book called Unlimited Power. This was back when this book was written was pretty high powered. I mean, it was a bestseller for a long time. I got a lot out of it when I read it the first, second, and third time. And almost every self-help book that's ever been good for me, I've had to read it two or three times because you're just not ready for all the stuff that's in there. And each thing that you pick up changes your position in life to a new place to where you see things differently. Then you go back and read the book again. You go, hmm, that's interesting. I didn't even see it that way the first time. And so you go through these things. And I'm just bringing this up because the other day I um, spent some time with a friend of mine who had been a real estate investor his entire life. Now, how can it be that it's entire life? His dad was a real estate investor. So he and his dad and his brother, you know, have been, he's been a real estate investor his entire life. I don't know if he's even had a job. I think he has a college degree and he he might be an engineer or something by trade, but I've never seen the guy work. And all the time I've known him, I've never seen him do anything but own real estate. And I was talking to him the other day about a real estate transaction I was looking at and just wanted to get his opinion on it since he's been doing it for years. You know, even myself, I've been doing this for 30 years. You do something a little different, like somebody's got a little more expertise in that specific field. And I was looking at that specific field that I had not done before. He had, and so I wanted to get some information. But I was really surprised at what I learned, which, yeah, I learned the stuff I needed to know about the transaction I was looking at. But really what I learned was that this guy had been investing since he was a kid. That his dad had him investing in stuff. And so he's got real estate transactions that go back... 20, 30, 40 years. And I'm thinking about it. I owned, 30 years ago, I owned 100 houses. I've sold all those. Then I bought a 10-unit apartment complex. I sold that. Uh, I, at one time, owned a 20-unit. I sold that. At one time, I owned a 30-unit. 
uh, which was 15 duplexes. I sold that. At one time, I owned a 40-unit apartment complex. I sold that. At one time, I had a 64. I sold that. I had a 68. I sold that. I had an 88. I sold that. I had 104. I sold that. I had a 34. I forgot my 34. I had a 34, and I sold that. I had a 156, and I sold that. I had a 256, and I sold that. I had a 270, and I sold that. I had 140, and I sold that, and I had a 320, and I sold that. Yeah, I still own six more apartment complexes, so what's happening is I'm selling the small ones and buying larger ones, right, more expensive ones, and just keep changing my portfolio. Well, this guy had done a little bit of that. I mean, he had, as he said when stuff gets really old, 20, 30 years old, he just didn't want to hassle with it anymore. He would sell it in 1031 into something newer, more expensive, and just keep rotating his portfolio. Now, I talked to a guy that was in charge of Camden Property Trust, which is probably the largest real estate trust in the country. And I think his name is Rick Campos. And I was sitting there having a drink with him one night, and I was asking him his, you know, his philosophy about it. And he says, we have an average life in our portfolio of about 10 years. He said, so if we've got something that's 15 years old, we need something five years old. So that average is 10. As they get older and older and older, we eventually get rid of them. We try to keep our average right around 10 years old or less. Interesting thing. Again, why? Because that's when the major capital expenses start to occur. Now, we've made a ton of money at Lifestyles and our members by buying that old stuff that these guys get rid of, fixing it up, renovating, raising the rents, increasing the income, decreasing the expenses, and making it worth a lot more money. That was our modus operandi for getting rich. But rich people who already have money want to buy new stuff. And so now that I'm successful financially, I'm buying new stuff, same thing. And um, I'm not buying it to fix it up. I'm buying it just for the cash flow. And I'm buying more and more and more of this type of stuff and less and less and less of the other type of stuff, the older stuff. And I'm upgrading my portfolio. My portfolio is becoming newer. Now, my portfolio is not yet an average of 10 years old. I'm not there yet, but it's getting a lot closer. I mean, it used to be an average of about 30 years old. And I'd say now my average is probably closer to 20, 15 to 20 years old as an average. Now, remember, that's I've got one property that's brand new. It adds to the average, but there's still older properties in the portfolio. So we, we look at these things and we think, what is our perspective? And the perspective that I had for years was for me to get wealthy, I needed to sell this stuff so I could double up in size. I could increase and buy newer stuff and and improve my portfolio. But here I'm running into a guy who's saying basically he's held on to the same stuff for 30 years. Ask him how many properties he had. He said he had 70 properties. Now we have people lifestyles that have 70 properties. In fact, we have quite a few people now that are up to that number. And you just wonder how long are they going to hold on to it? Well, in our group, if you're in 70 deals, you're probably passive investor. And as a passive investor, you probably aren't picking when the deal's being sold or refinanced. You're waiting on the lead investor to make that decision, and then they give you back a chunk of money. And you go on and say, okay, I need to redeploy that money and move on to something else. That's just the way it would be. And so with that said, you know, you're in this constant rearrangement. I find myself perplexed right now because interest rates are falling. And so when interest rates fall, rates of return fall across the board. And so I'm finding interest rate, or I'm finding returns lower than what I would normally like to see. And as I was talking to this guy yesterday, he's sitting there going, I've got these great rates of return. He was naming off, you know, I said, well, what's your lowest return? He goes, ah, my lowest return is 7%. He goes, normally it's 9, 10. He says, I've got a bunch of stuff up around 12. And I'm going, wow. And then I thought back, I used to have stuff that was in that range all over the place. But what happened? I sold it. He didn't completely different point of view. When we come back, we're going to talk about where does your point of view come from. We'll be right back with the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Dell 
Theo Wamsley explains how he found that speck of light that got him into the lifestyle. I had a guy who used to come into the health club every day and work out for four hours a day, sit in the jacuzzi, swim, play racquetball, was happy, looked great, tan all the time. And one day I just asked him, what do you do for a living? And he said, Dell, I own real estate. Well, do you own real estate? Register for our live online free workshop and find out how you can get all the things you want out of life with passive income. Register at lifestylesunlimitedworkshop.com. Brought to you by Lifestyles Unlimited. Welcome back. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Welcome back to Del Wamsley Radio Show. Today, we're discussing um, where do you get your ideas from and what basic belief systems do you live by? And uh, are they effective for you? And we're going into a book here by Tony Robbins called Unlimited Power. And we're going into a chapter called The Seven Lies of Success. And he calls them lies, not because they are lies, but because we don't know if they're lies or not. His basic premise is that how do we really even know if anything we believe to be true is true? And then he goes further with that argument and says, well, if we don't know what is actually true, There's really no way to understand the power of the mind. You go back to Napoleon Hill, whatever the mind of man can conceive, it can believe it can, whatever it can conceive and believe it can achieve. If you believe that, then you really believe you can achieve anything. And so the question is, is that real or not? And what he's saying is by saying, here's these seven lies about the way we see things is that we really don't know. But if, We don't really know why not believe them the way we believe they should be, the way that would empower us. In other words, if you get out of bed every day and you go, my life is terrible, then your life is going to be terrible. If you get out of bed every day and go, man, my life is amazing, you're going to find reasons to believe that your life is amazing. Now, this is the basic concept behind this whole chapter. But he gets down into it and covers some very specific ideas. The first one is everything happens for a reason and a purpose, and it serves us. That reason, that purpose serve us. So I think back to it, I think about the worst thing that ever happened to me in my entire life, I think, was to be born a fat kid. Fourth grade, weighed about 200 pounds. Big, giant, roly-poly fat kid, fat face, fat cheeks, you know, like a 40-inch belt that was pulled all the way out to the last little hole in the buckle and type thing and flat top haircut and Coke bottle glasses. I mean, Coke bottle thick glasses. So you just think of any cartoons or Spanky and the gang and think of the fattest, ugliest kid out there. And that was me. Wow. So how could I believe that served me? Well, what it did is it made me an early proponent for physical fitness, an early proponent for physical beauty, an early proponent for taking control of my life, willpower to stop eating, to build up the habit of getting up and exercising on a regular basis. That habit led to the ability to create other habits that led to my ability to create wealth, relationships, fitness, et cetera, et cetera. So if I had never done that, I would have grown up just like everybody else, all the cute little kids who I hated, by the way, at that time. Uh, All the cute little kids that had all the friends and got all the the accolades from the school teachers and the parents and everything drove me crazy. I mean, just think, can you feel the hatred I had for these people at that time, which I don't really have anymore? Because since then, I have stayed in shape and they have gotten fat and they smoke cigarettes and they wear Coke bottle glasses and their hair isn't combed. I saw a guy the other day, like 400 pounds at the bar yesterday, disheveled hair. And I mean, the guy was sitting in the bar stool and his belly went at least two feet from his side across and up and underneath of the bar. I mean, he couldn't get it, even get up to the bar. His belly was so big. I mean, the guy had legs that I swear to God were almost as big. He was as big around as a barrel, uh, like a wine barrel. And his legs were as big around as a tire. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And you say, well, Dell, you're so judgmental. I say, yeah, you know, I am. And the reason I'm that judgmental is because I know you don't have to look that way, no matter who you are. I was born with big bones, as they say. I was born with a slow metabolism. I used to say, I have the metabolism of a sloth. And yet, I was able to control and win that battle. 
But that victory did way more for me than just allow me to get in shape and win all kinds of athletic awards and so forth, which built my confidence, built my ego up, you know, gave me the confidence to go speak to women. Back then it was girls, now it's women. And I didn't have any of that. It all came from that overcoming that challenge in my life. So everything happens for a reason and a purpose. And that reason and purpose serves you is an ideal I can live with. So if you had anything that was really bad for you, and um, I've had all kinds of medical things go wrong with me, and for the, for the heck of me, I can't figure out why I had to have cancer. What did that? How did that serve me? I can't figure out why uh, they had to cut my intestines out and put them, you know, sew me back together, and give me a colostomy sack. I haven't figured out what that taught me, but it had to teach me something. I don't know what it was. Maybe I was eating wrong. You know, there's something, right? There's something you're doing in life that, you know, it needs correction. And so when things happen, they let you know. I know I lost all my money in the stock market. And at the same time, I lost my money in the stock market. I also lost some money in Ponzi schemes I got into, real estate Ponzi schemes. I lost some money in some oil wells we drilled, and they went, you know, they capped them off and stole the money from us. And that by the interesting little thing is they, they would drill these gas wells. Then they'd say gas prices were too low to bring the gas out of the ground. Limited partnership that you were in to drill the gas wells would last 10 years. At the end of 10 years, they say the partnership's over. Uh, we're going to sell the gas wells. Well, they would say, let us buy you out for, you know, pennies on the dollar. So you'd get bought out pennies on the dollar, and then they'd own gas wells. And then they'd turn around, sell them for a bunch of money, and never let you know that. It's a scam. I mean, it's, it's gone on for years. Hence, what did that teach me? Always do my own deals. Always be the one in control of the deals. Or only invest an amount of money that you're willing to lose. That's, you know, that's the way I invest. I'll put big chunks in stuff that I control. But if I'm not in control of that money and I'm doing do a deal with somebody else, I'm going to be passing. I'm giving them a teeny tiny amount of my money. Respectfully, I could give them a lot and still wouldn't be very much percentage-wise of my money. But I'm giving them a small amount even though it's a minuscule percentage. Why? Because if they lose it, I don't want to hate them. If they lose it, I don't want to hate myself for making that decision. So, you know, there was something learned in those losses also. And so look at your life from this point forward as, hey, these things are happening for a reason. What, what should I have learned from all these things that occurred in my life? I think that's where you really need to be. I think that's an important position is to be able to say that stuff happens, but it happens for a reason. There should be something learned. It should be teaching us something. It should be lending itself to our success in one way or another. Maybe it's just success itself. I think learning from others is a way to use success to teach us success. We'll be right back with the Dell Walmsley Radio Show. some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Welcome back to Del Wamsley Radio Show. Today we're discussing mindsets of successful people. We're uh, following through the outline of a book by Tony Robbins called Unlimited Power. And we're in a chapter called The Seven Lies and um, of Success, The Seven Lies of Success. So we're... Um, we're on lie number two, as he calls it. And by the way, the lie doesn't mean it's a lie. It means we don't know if it works or not. So the belief number two is there's no such thing as failure. And he reverts back to a story that I've heard many, many times, I think probably in his book first, but maybe other books, which is the story about um, a, a guy named of, uh, Edison. And Edison, Thomas Edison, who uh, invented the light bulb, and somebody was interviewing him, a reporter was interviewing him, he goes, uh, Mr. Edison, is it true that you failed 999 times uh, before you actually developed the light bulb that worked? And he said, no, that's not really true. He said, I was successful 999 times in finding out what didn't work. 
concept being is that in science, trial and error is how you get somewhere. You have to eliminate possibilities. And if you hold that to be true in life, then life is trial and error as a whole. And I've always had a problem with this one as a self-help belief system. And I'm going to argue both sides of this for you, okay? The problem I have with it is, why would you go out there and try to figure out a thousand different ways to diet when somebody's already figured it out? Why would you go out there and try to figure out a thousand different ways to um, make money when other people have already figured it out? To me, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error is not the effective way of doing it. Now, does it work? Well, I didn't have really a mentor in real estate. I mean, I read some books, got some ideas, and then I formulated my own working theory, right? And then I taught my working theory, and then we perfected that theory over 30 years of a lot of investors doing a lot of what we do and getting better at it, right? And more and more information, more and more education, we formulated and really peaked that idea of exactly what works and what doesn't. So why would you want to go reinvent the wheel and do that all over again? It doesn't make any sense to me at all. All right. So where do I rationalize that that argument might have some wherewithal to it? Because I've been dieting since I was 14 years old and um, I've never been able to successfully diet straight through an entire time. In other words, if this is a 12 week diet program, I can't go 12 weeks straight. What would happen is I would break off of my diet somewhere and binge. And if you know anything about dieting, that physiologically is probably the right thing to do. Your body just can't go that deep without starting to just deteriorate. So a binge now and then allows your body to come back to normal and get its strength back. But the reality is, is that that's a failure of that diet or is it? And my argument is it's really not a failure. You know, it's not a failure of that diet. Another one that you could argue is that, um, it's been said that um, I drink too much alcohol by people. And I say, ooh, God, okay. Uh, maybe I'll cut back. And I'll cut back for a week or two weeks. or Sometimes I think the longest I've ever cut back and I drank it all was like three weeks, four weeks, something like that. And then I'll decide to drink. But I will decide, hey, okay, I want to do this. And you could look at that and say it's a failure, right? And I could say, no, it was a Three or four weeks success. I did what I set out to do, but all things don't last forever. So this argument here can go either way, however you see it. He has an interesting one. He talks about um, Abraham Lincoln. He says, here's a gentleman that failed in business at 21, was defeated for legislative race in 22, failed again in business at 24, overcame the death of his sweetheart at age 26, had a nervous breakdown at age 27. I guess he didn't really overcome that. Lost congressional race at 34, lost a congressional race again at 36, uh, lost a senatorial race at 45, failed in an effort to become vice president at age 47, lost a senatorial race again at age 49, and then was elected president of the United States at age 52 years of age. <sighs> was he a failure, right? He failed in almost everything he tried to do. Yet he became one of the greatest presidents of in our history. So are you a failure if you don't hit it out of the park right away? Probably not. You need to look at things as if, okay, that was a learning curve. That wasn't failure. I just learned another of the 999 things I know won't work now. And I can look back at all my investment ideas that I've tried and I look at them and I can very easily tell myself, I didn't know that didn't work. Now I do. Wish somebody would have told me. It would have been a lot nicer if somebody would have told me, but they didn't. And so I tried it and it didn't work. Right. Belief number three, whatever happens, take the responsibility for it. I've never seen a more failed position in life than to point the finger at everybody else and blame everybody else for your failures. There's an old saying, if you take your fist and you point a finger at someone, uh, you've got three fingers pointing back directly at you. Successful people buy into their own failures, buy into their successes and buy into their failures. And they have no problem admitting it. Yeah, I screwed that one up. I'll tell you, it's, it's one of those things that you have to learn that if you're not willing to accept your own failures, then you have no control. Think about that again. If you do not believe that what happens to you in life is a result of what you do in life, then you have no control in life. And so 
when I see all these politicians out there blaming each other about what's going wrong, it's very easy for me to see that neither one of them have any idea how to fix anything. They're just both dumb as a rock. And I would be willing to meet either side and meet with them personally and tell them they're dumb as a rock because they're just doing dumb stuff, right? They just do it. They haven't figured it out. So what do you do if you don't know what you're doing? You blame it on somebody else. What do you do if you have no control? You blame it on somebody else. So there it is. When you blame, you're pointing that finger. There's three fingers pointing back to you saying, hey, these three are saying you're the idiot. So you've got to take responsibility for whatever happens in your life. Number four, it's not necessary to understand everything to be able to use everything. Wow, that's a deep one. And it's true. Do you understand how a car works? I don't. You know, do you understand how many things in life work? The answer being no, that you still use. I have no idea how an iPhone works. I use it, right? I mean, I have a basic concept, but I really can't. I couldn't take it apart and put it back together. I couldn't build one. I couldn't create anything similar to it even. But I sure know how to use it. And that's true for so many other things in life that we use. They're there. They're, they're effective to us. But we really don't understand exactly how they're put together, how they work. So ideas like self-help ideas of whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe it can achieve, you don't really know how that works. How does a thought attract stuff to you? Now, I'm of the belief it does. When I wanted to be ripped to shreds when I was a fat kid, I ended up ripped to shreds. When I wanted to be rich when I was a poor kid, I ended up rich. Those two ideals, right? I wanted a beautiful wife, I got a beautiful wife. Those three ideals I wouldn't let go of. And because they were important to me and I wouldn't let go of them, I ended up with them. Now, how did an idea attract the very thing that the idea was about? That's the real question, isn't it? The real question is, how does that work? And we don't know. And that's the whole point of this statement. It's that you don't have to know for it to work. You don't even have to believe it. People that believe in God and the Bible, nobody knows how God and the Bible works or if it's even real. But the ones who use it for good in their life they know how to use it for good in their life. The rest of the people on the outside going, I have no, no idea if that works or not. Well, what good are they getting from it? Whatever you put into something is what you get out of it, my friends. We'll be right back with the Del Wamsley Radio Show. Wamsley on designing a lifestyle. When I was younger, I decided that I was not going to live the life that the average person lived, which was to think I was going to work for the end of my life, save up enough money, and then when I'm old and gray like I am now, try to buy my life back with a pile of money that I had. I said, no, I'm going to design a life and I'm going to live that life. That's it. Period. Are you ready to design your life? Learn how at Lifestyles Unlimited's live online free workshop. Register at lifestylesunlimitedworkshop.com. Welcome back. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Welcome back to Del Wamsley Radio Show. Today, we're discussing ideas that could be beneficial to you and your success. Uh, we're going through a book by Tony Robbins called Unlimited Power. We're in one chapter here called The Seven Lives of Success. And uh, we are now up to lie number five. Or belief number five, because again, as I told you earlier in the book, he's calling it a lie because he says, I can't prove it's true. It's just my belief, and it's my belief makes me successful. So uh, belief number five is people are your greatest resource. And man, I got to go all day long with this one. One of the things that I learned later in life, not early on in life, but later in life, is this one, is that people are your greatest resource. And when I was younger, I made everything harder on myself because I was unfriendly to people. Self-loathing, maybe, 
is why I did it. I don't know. I uh, thought everybody else was looking down at me. And so, I, you know, I had a chip on my shoulder, whatever. But, man, it sure made getting through life difficult. Once I figured out, and I, I took a course that actually taught me this, believe it or not. It was a, a, called How to Win Friends and Influence People. Can you believe that? How to Win Friends and Influence People. I actually took a course on this stuff. And I learned how to deal with people. So my companies said, Dell, you're really, really brilliant at business. But you suck with people. <laughs> Everybody hates you. But you got the best work ethic, the best ideas, and the best organization we've ever seen. So we're going to send you. We're going to invest some money in you and send you over here and teach you how to be friendly to people, I guess, is what they're basically doing. And it worked. I mean, I sat in front of the mirror, learned to smile, learned to shake hands correctly, uh, learned to, you know, uh, not hate people when you meet them, learned to... Uh, realize how important they are as a human being across from you and learn to look for the good in people when you met them. Well, what did that do for me? Well, at first it just got me in the door, so I was, had less people disliking me right off the bat, but it wasn't until I started watching people that were really good with people. And have you ever met a connector? I mean, the connector is that kind of person that knows everybody. They remember everybody's name. They remember everybody's story. But they're the guy that you call when you want something. You know, I know a guy... I know a guy who knows a guy, you know, and I found these people come into place like lifestyles where there's, you know, lots of people here and in no time at all, they've befriended all of the most successful people. Oh my gosh, I've heard about you. You're so great. And you go like, well, they're just kissing up to people. That's disgusting. Nah, it really isn't just kissing up to them. It may start out as kissing up to them. Uh, I had people do that to me at one seminar one time. I ended up being partners with them. We bought like two two apartment complexes. Actually, we bought five apartment complexes together. And it was just because a guy ran up to me and bought me a beer and said, hey, man, I got to talk to you, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he just knew how to network. He was really good at it. And his wife was a good secondary network person. So he was the da-da-da-da-da guy, and she was the down-to-earth, knew everything, uh, solid rock person that you'd want to have as a friend. Well... I've met many other people like this, and especially at Lifestyles, and they come in, and in no time at all, they know everybody, and they're everybody's friend, and they're getting this for you from that guy. Let me get this for you. Let me get this guy. I know this guy. that that guy. And in no time at all, they're 10 times farther along than you are. They just work their way right past everybody in that line. It's just an amazing thing. And once I learned how to do that, it blew my mind how easy and how effective it was. And I'm, I'm going to tell you some really cheap, blundery kind of idea things about it. But we don't go to a bar that we're not known. Wherever we go, we get extra sauce, extra this, extra that, extra large servings, a drink on the house. Why? Because Melissa and I are just great networkers. And it's funny. They, they remember Melissa for her attributes. They remember me for my attributes, but they remember us. In fact, it's funny because they even remember us together because we're together so often and we fit together so well. So we have this networking team. And so, like I said, we don't go anywhere. When I went and purchased Melissa's uh, wedding gift or uh, her anniversary gift. I walked in the door of this jewelry store and I go, hey, Del Wamsley, how are you doing? Great. I said, yeah, I'm looking for a wedding, you know, an anniversary gift for my wife. And I said, oh, let me look at these things. And he, he looked at me and goes, no, nah, 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 that's not what she wants. I said, really? He goes, ah, no, nah. she was in here last year, I think at Christmas. And this is what she wanted. And I go, wow, man. So I'm coming home with a winner. Because this dude knew exactly what my wife wanted. Now, that is the power of people. The other power of people is I have an executive vice president that's top notch. I mean, over the top good. And she has hired just incredible vice presidents at different levels and different divisions. And she keeps them. She has a, a quality uh, of being able to attract really intelligent people around her. I mean, she's intelligent. And so she attracts other intelligent people. And I think... I don't think she likes to work with anybody who's not intelligent, maybe the, the key. But again, it's people. And I look at my company sometimes now, and I think about 20 years ago when it used to be run by another guy, and all of the people that worked for us back then, almost everybody was half rate. I mean, they were really, if they weren't low class, which most of them were low class, they were not that smart, definitely not that hardworking, definitely not that educated. And they were just a complete different group of people. But that was his group of people. That's who he hung out with. That's who he associates with. And to this day, he's still out there associating with that same clientele of people. But in our group, 
you've got a much higher, higher one time level of customer because we have a higher level of employee because we have a much, much higher level of management. And it's all about people. And because of that, I don't have to do anything. I own 11, 5, 16 companies, 17 companies, somewhere around there, 16, 17 companies. And I don't have a key to the door of any of them. I don't manage any of them. I don't go to work in any of them. In fact, the funny part is they're trying to get me to do something right now. (laughs) We'll see if it works out. rest of you, keep in mind, we're not doing this for a little money. We're doing it for a lifestyle. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you tomorrow. The Del Wamsley Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Del Wamsley Show constitutes an endorsement, recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.